you got an idea about the intercostal muscles uh, there, but what else? Well, as we mentioned earlier, we have uh, a neural vascular bundle, which is like artery vein and uh, nerve there. So we call them intercostal neurovascular bundle that you see. You remember when we talked about the upper and lower border of the rib and we mentioned in the lower border of typical rib we have a costal groove. Costal groove to contain mainly these structures although not all of them like contained there but look at the costal groove here and look at the contents in neurovascular bundle. So these New, or let us say this neurovascular bundle located between as I mentioned earlier the inter the uh, internal intercostal and innermost intercostal that means they located between the internal and innermost intercostal uh, muscles look at the arrangement of um, the structures of a neurovascular bundle the most uh, I would say hidden one is the intercostal vein then a little bit inferior to the intercostal artery then the most outer or let us say exposed inferior one which is mainly it's vulnerable for injury we call the intercostal nerve that means the intercostal nerve is the most structure there exposed and more vulnerable for injury especially during a couple of procedures we will explain uh, one or two of them, right? That uh, look, look at the um, uh, here inferiorly at the upper border of the rib below. Not just the structures in the costal groove in the inferior border of the rib, but also there is um, a neuro, a couple of structures including vessels and nerve at the upper border of the rib below. We call them collateral uh, branch. So, in order to memorize the arrangement of the uh, structures in the subcostal groove we abbreviate them in something called van that from top to bottom we have van that means vein artery and uh, nerve right so if you look at them again you know that um, they are located between the internal intercostal and innermost intercostal but we know that the innermost intercostal muscle is, is like um, it's not continuous muscle right so it's like three parts suppose you know and of course you know we have vessels here vein I mean artery and vein and uh, nerve so when there is no innermost uh, intercostal muscle so you know we have instead the endothoracic fascia you see this fascia that line the innermost muscle so it's located here and so it's it's kind of a protex or let us say cover the gaps uh, there so let me start with the intercostal nerves I think you remember from the previous lecture we divided the ribs and vertebrae into typical and uh, atypical well guys the intercostal nerves as well can be divided into typical and um, atypical well very simply the uh, you know we have uh, the uh, intercostal nerves uh, that we talk about you remember that we have spinal uh, here spinal nerves right thoracic spinal nerves and you know that the thoracic spinal nerves divided into anterior rami and posterior um, uh, uh, rami that means you have anterior ramus and posterior ramus right so the intercostal nerves that we talk about um, are the anterior rami so this is the anterior rami of thoracic spinal uh, nerve this is what we are talking about so uh, it extends, of course, from T1 up to uh, all the way down until you reach T11. Uh, what about T12? No, T12 is not intercostal because it's below rib number 12. So it's subcostal, not intercostal. Anyway, um, let us, uh, as we talk about, let me erase this. Uh, oh, sorry. So, um, so we mentioned that we have typical nerves. They are between three and six because you know 
we have to see what typical and atypical among uh, those nerves from T1 to T11. T1, and we will talk about both of them, and T2, they are atypical. That means the T3 to T6 are typical, right? Then, what about T7? From T7 all the way down until you reach, let us say, 11, also atypical. That, well, T3, from T3 to T6, to T6 just the atypical. You know why? Because do you remember the sub um, the uh, the subcostal groove? So was supposed to be that intercostal nerve passed there, right? In the subcostal or close to subcostal um, uh, groove. So this is correct just for T3 to T6. But you know that. Um, the first rib and the second rib, they are flat. That means they don't have subcostal groove. Well, that means we will jump to uh, T3 and T6. Plus, of course, we will talk about both of them, but just this is just introduction, right? While the T7 to T11, they are close to the anterior abdominal wall, so once they reach the anterior abdominal wall, they continue uh, there to form thoracoabdominal uh, nerves. So uh, just from T3 to T6, those just uh, intercostal nerves that pass in the subcostal groove and they just stop anteriorly, right? So, uh, maybe it's good to know that the intercostal uh, nerves are mixed nerves. That means they supply, they are sensory and motor. That means they um, uh, carry sensations from the skin, from the thorax, abdomen, and uh, lateral wall of the thorax as well. Uh, plus, they innervate the uh, muscles uh, I mean intercostal muscles and the muscles in the anterior also abdominal wall plus they get in there and uh, they innervate the uh, parietal pleura in the thorax and peritoneum parietal peritoneum of course we talk about parietal parietal peritoneum parietal peritoneum and parietal pleura right so um, you know we have if you want to dig deep a little bit on the intercostal nerves, so we mentioned that the uh, you know that uh, we have a spinal cord, and uh, in the thoracic region you have thoracic spinal nerves. Thoracic spinal nerves divided uh, into anterior ramus and for what we call the intercostal nerve and posterior ramus posterior ramus to the back anterior ramus is the anterior is the intercostal nerves and uh, it gives the anterior ramus i mean it gives like many brands including rami communicants rami communicants what's the rami communicants just leave it for now and in the next slide i will let us desc describe it now so, again, uh, this is the uh, spinal nerve, right? Then it divided into posterior ramus and anterior ramus. Then the anterior ramus, or for what we call it in, uh, intercostal nerve, it gives like, you see these two branches, these kind, you know, the nerves, their fibers from there, uh, you know, this is the anterior ramus or intercostal nerve, how the intercostal nerve will be connected to the closed sympathetic trunk. Maybe you have no idea about sympathetic trunk. You can wait to the third year, to the next year, I mean, to the nervous system. But for now, the sympathetic trunk is a part of sympathetic system. It's like um, a pedant string on each side of the vertebral column. And there are too much details about that, but for now, um, let us say that the intercostal nerve, the anterior ramus, or the intercostal nerve connected to the sympathetic trunk by these branches. This is the, uh, we call it white rami, that means the fibers, uh, let me raise it, that means the fibers 
come from the uh, anterior ramus and get into the sympathetic trunk here by the white, white ramus, then once the synapses, um, synapse occurs here, then fibers pass from sympathetic trunk back to the intercostal nerve or anterior ramus through the gray ramus. That means fibers get into sympathetic trunk through white ramus and exit through gray ramus. Why white, white and gray? This is something related to the fibers that here is myelinated, white color, and here is like demyelinated or unmyelinated, let's say, not demyelinated, unmyelinated, sorry. Okay, so, um, this is these the white ramus and gray ramus we call them rami communicants because they communicate the anterior ramus or the, the what we call it intercostal nerve with the sympathetic trunk correlated to it so this is the story usually they are located here right so it gives like this is the sympathetic uh, trunk so this is uh, uh say for example for example um the uh, the white ramus and this is the gray ramus right this is number one also you have collateral uh, branch what's the collateral branch yeah uh, this is the collateral branch it comes from where near the angle near the angle of the rib here again let me erase that and look this is the intercostal nerve then the you know it passes in the uh, subcostal close or in the subcostal groove so near the angle of the rib it gives like a, a small branch let us say it goes down to pass on the upper border of the rib below this is the rib below so on the it passes on the upper uh, part of the rib uh, below as you see here indeed it participates in the innervation of muscles uh, of intercostal uh, muscles uh, there and this is the collateral branch there is also collateral uh, not just nerve there is also vessels and veins but the idea that at the angle of the rib the intercostal nerve gives like a branch passes down and then it continues on the upper border of the rib below you remember this picture you remember that let me sh you remember that you see these collateral branches so they come from the upper border and pass on the uh, upper border of uh, of the rib below so these are collateral branches nerve artery and vein that means if you want to get through the intercostal space we will talk about it but just just keep it in your mind if you want to get to the to the lung for example or whatever uh, through the intercostal space you need to choose uh, uh, carefully where to get in make sure you are not completely at the upper border not completely uh, stick to the lower border of rib above try to be in between close to the upper border of the rib below right anyway uh, so uh, we have collateral branch and also you know we need like uh, 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 branch to carry sensations from the thorax and uh, thorax laterally and uh, the abdomen of course anteriorly uh, uh, so you have here laterally cutaneous branch you see just to know these lateral cutaneous uh, lateral cutaneous branch um, they arise at the level of mid axillary line. If you take the mid axillary line there, this is the level from where they emerge, right? So this is a lateral cutaneous branch to carry sensations um, from the lateral aspect of the thorax. Then it divides into posterior branch and anterior branch, as you see. Then the spinal, the intercostal nerve continues all the way until it reaches anteriorly. Once it gets there it gives like again not laterally cutaneous branch no anterior cutaneous branch because it's anteriorly right it gives medial and lateral not anterior and posterior branch no medial and lateral also look at the sensations from the thorax uh, thoracic uh, uh, wall anteriorly and if you go below the t3 
and T6, let us from here there, it also, um, now you have the abdomen here, and that means uh, also these intercostal nerves carry uh, sensations from the uh, skin of the anterior abdominal wall as well. Plus, these nerves to the abdomen not just carry sensations from the skin, but also it, they innervate the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, right? So, branch to the pleura with the help of collateral and to the peritoneum, the, uh, the membrane uh, that lines the abdominal wall, right? The brittle peritoneum, I mean, through 7 to uh, 11. So, we explain that and Again, back again to the typical and atypical, although I don't like to talk too much about it, but it's good to know that uh, where is, you know, here is you have T2, right? Where is T1? It's not shown here, but T1, you know, it's atypical. Number one, because, you know, the first rib is flat and also the second one. So there is no subcostal groove. This is number one. So the T, uh, the T1, I mean the first uh, thoracic nerve or first intercostal nerve let us call it um, it's uh, uh, atypical it's not typical I mean and uh, because not passes through a subcostal groove and also because it contributes to the uh, brachial plexus to the upper limb it joins uh, the brachial plexus by a large branch that corresponds to the um, lateral cutaneous branch lateral cutaneous a branch okay plus the t1 has no anterior cutaneous branch has no anterior cutaneous branch right because it joins the brachial looks us anyway so let us move because we are talking about the a typical the non-typical intercostal nerve number one is the t1 and also t2 what about t2 this is t2 it's also not in subcostal groove number one and indeed you know the uh, it has that's fine it has lateral cutaneous branch but the lateral cutaneous branch of t2 we call it also intercostal brachial nerve intercostal we know why brachial brachial that means something related to the arm what's well, called intercostal brachial nerve because it joins the uh, uh, joins the uh, what we call medial uh, cutaneous nerve of the arm if this is the lateral cutaneous there is a medial uh, cutaneous nerve uh, of the arm that joins of course the lateral cutaneous branch of T2. That's why now T2 is like a typical, right? That's applied, of course, the middle side of the arm. We call it intercostal brachial nerve. That's why if there is a pain in the heart, for example, you will get pain, referred pain, because of this shared um, uh, if this joint, um, let us say, nerves, so the pain will be felt in the medial side of the arm. It's called referred pain. Okay, so we said that the atypical intercostal nerves are T1, T2, and from T7 to T11. Why T7 to T11? Um, because T7 to T11, they are no longer being between the ribs. That means they leave the inter, you know, uh, the ribs and the sub, the uh, subcostal area, subcostal margin. So T7 and uh, up to T11, that means 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 intercostal nerves, they leave the intercostal space and passes behind there to, you know, the subcostal uh, groove, subcostal margin, sorry and continue to supply here is the abdomen right to supply the skin the muscles and inside it also inside the abdominal wall the peritoneum brittle peritoneum of abdominal wall that means 
uh, skin muscles and peritoneum of anterior abdominis. So these nerves um, do all of these <coughs> things. That's why they are, I don't know, we call them atypical. Because what should be typical, that from T3 to T7, just stay in, this, in the intercostal space. Anyway, back to T2, as I mentioned, um, the skin here, look at the intercostal brachial nerve here, in which it joins the uh, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, right? So, uh, in case of any, uh, like, coronary artery disease, like if there is a stenosis or a blockage in the coron one of the uh, coronary arteries of the heart, so pain referred along uh, this nerve to the medial side of the arm. Look how the uh, 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 intercostal brachial nerve here join the medial cutaneous branch of the arm. Here, that's why pain would be referred to the medial side of the arm. We call it referred pain. So, also, we talked about uh, the intercostal nerves with uh, too much details, I would say. But we cannot ignore the, uh, uh, the, the, the skin and the innervation of the skin. That means the sensations from the skin. So what we call cutaneous nerve. We mentioned that we have laterally cutaneous nerve and we have anterior cutaneous nerve. So when you say uh, this is a segmental innervation of the thoracic uh, wall, as you see here, and the the abdomen as well, we call it dermatomes when you say dermatomes that means you're talking about innervation of the skin not muscles skin right and you know when you say skin that means you know, a sensation so this is the anterior view and this is the posterior view of your back so let us say here above the level of external angle the sensations from the skin here is above uh, it comes from supraclavicular nerve. This is the clavicle, right? So there is a kind of um, a nerves here called supra, that means above, supraclavicular nerves. They passes or already formed by C3 and C4 of cervical spinal nerves, right? Of cervical nerves. So they form C3 and 4 they create a kind of abscess with each other to innervate the area above the sternal angle here, above, you know, close to the clavicle, right? Um, we call them supraclavicular uh, nerves. But below that, below the sternal angle, you see the segmental innervation of the anterior and lateral abdominal, uh, thoracic and abdominal wall formed by the laterally cutaneous nerve of intercostal nerve. Let me show you here again. You remember the, uh, okay, we have to erase this. Okay, so uh, you remember, this is the intercostal nerve and this is the laterally cutaneous nerve that emerged at the level of mid axillary line. So they do really uh, a great job uh, there right so below the sternal angle here is the uh, you have the lateral cutaneous and once reach anteriorly it gives anterior cutaneous as you see here here is anterior cutaneous and lateral cutaneous so they cover the lateral and anterior area of the thorax and uh, mainly the thorax and mainly part from the abdomen as well um, now, posteriorly, you know, we have here the, look, the spinal nerves, it divides into anterior ramus or intercostal nerve and posterior ramus. Look at the posterior nerve ramus. Posterior ramus goes back to the, so to the back. That means it um, uh, innervates the skin of the back, the muscles of the back, and the joints as well right okay so in addition to intercostal nerves we have 
uh, the uh, intercostal arteries and veins and let me start with the intercostal arteries uh, I'm not gonna talk too much here in this slide but I would like to know when you say intercostal arteries we um, each intercostal space that is to say intercostal space we have one single uh, intercostal artery and anteriorly you have uh, two anterior intercostal arteries right so each artery uh, gives if like um, a branch to the muscle skin and brighter pleura plus the breast right so these are blood vessels to supply the skin outside the muscles and brighter pleura inside the thoracic cavity and the breast as well so let us start from the back so this is the uh, vertebral column and these are the ribs and this is the aorta or thoracic or descending aorta so look at these vessels vessels come out posteriorly so let us start with the uh, posterior intercostal artery I don't want to talk too much uh, about the posterior intercostal artery but very simple uh, the first intercostal space and the second uh, intercostal space the blood supply um, come directly from what we call it superior intercostal artery right leave it for now superior there is an artery called superior intercostal artery we'll talk about it now but the lower nine intercostal spaces uh, they uh, got their blood supply from the thoracic aorta very simple remember the thoracic aorta in the back so the uh, say if you if you uh, just uh, skip the first and second intercostal space the rest of intercostal spaces or uh, the intercostal arches there come from the thoracic aorta so back to the first and second intercostal arteries here look at the subclavian artery that's below the clavicle and above the first rib this is the first rib this subclavian artery one of the brands called costo cervical trunk costo from its name costo that means something to the ribs cervical to our neck costo cervical trunk this costo cervical trunk it gives one branch here not that goes to the up no that one that twisted below to give like a blood supply to the first and second we call this one is the superior intercostal artery yes it goes to the intercostal the first and second intercostal space we be severe we call it superior or sometimes they call it supreme intercostal artery very simple to give the first and second intercostal space while the rest lower nine intercostal spaces they come as you see here from the thoracic uh, aorta okay now what about the course and the branching of these intercostal arteries I'm, I'm talking about the posterior intercostal arteries indeed they are similar and follow the intercostal nerves if you, if you don't know the course and the branch of intercostal nerves then you watch the uh, uh, previous uh, slides right now let us jump now anteriorly we finished the posterior intercostal artery now let us move anteriorly anteriorly we divide it into our six intercostal spaces and lower five because you know we have 11 intercostal spaces and intercostal arteries so anteriorly you know maybe this artery from the from the cardiovascular system it is the internal thoracic artery internal from its name internal thoracic artery this artery located just one finger breadth lateral to the sternum from inside from inside from not from outside so you have to open the sternum and look to the thorax from inside you will see just one centimeter or one finger breadth lateral on each side to the sternum there is two arteries we call them internal thoracic artery or it's known as internal memory artery internal memory artery because it supplies the uh the breast that's why it's called internal memory mainly internal memory artery anyway this artery of course it's a branch um, uh, uh, from the first part of subclavian artery again to subclavian artery it gives the internal thoracic artery on the right and on the left 
and the internal thoracic artery goes all the way until it reaches the sixth intercostal space. Then it divided into superior epigastric artery to the abdomen and the musculophrenic artery. Musculophrenic artery. So this musculophrenic artery passes along the costal margin here. You see? Along the costal margin. That means it divided the internal thoracic artery divided at the sixth intercostal space. Um, uh, so we can say that the upper six intercostal spaces are, um, uh, or the uh, the upper six um, uh, intercostal arteries, they come from internal thoracic artery, right? And if you dig deep here into internal and uh, into um, anterior intercostal arteries here it gives uh it's not clear this one is good right this is the anterior intercostal artery that comes from the internal thoracic artery then it divided directly into two branch one up and one below the upper one it goes on the lower border of the rib above while the second branch it Paths, it passes along the upper border, not the lower, no, at the upper border of the rib below, as you see here. Um, so, so, of course, they communicate with the uh, posterior intercostal arteries, right there. Now, let us come now. To the musculophrenic artery and as I mentioned look at this musculophrenic artery it gives like the lower five intercostal arteries this is musculophrenic artery passes along the uh, costal margin and look at the prance from there right to the end Okay, now by this way, we can say, yes, we finished the posterior and anterior intercostal arteries. Here is like you look into the, uh, here's a cadaver, you look into the thoracic wall, but posterior, this is the posterior surface. That means you are inside the chest, inside the thoracic cavity, and you look anteriorly. This is the sternum, but posteriorly from the back, from the inside of the thorax, right? And look at the subclavian artery and the internal thoracic artery, internal thoracic artery or internal internal mammary artery, right? So again, in this figure also, um, you see the internal thoracic artery and vein, internal thoracic artery and vein, lateral to the sternum, one finger or one centimeter lateral to it. Then at the level of sixth intercostal space, the internal thoracic artery um, divided into superior epigastric artery and muscle. Look at the musculophrenic. Look at the musculophrenic vessels passes along the costal margin. So take care. Okay. That was about the intercostal artery, but what about the intercostal veins? That's very simple. Also, we will divide it uh, in order like to make it easy to study it into, again, posterior and anterior, similar to the artery. Okay, now let us start with the posterior intercostal vein. Of course, on each side you have 11 uh, spaces. So... For the veins, when you say posterior intercostal vein, uh, we will also subdivide it uh, into right and left because the right different a little bit than the left. But if you if you want like a general answer, if you want a general answer, uh, which is not one hundred percent correct, but if you the general answer for the drainage of the the posterior wall of the thorax here, you can say to the azygous vein. This is, is a zygous vein. It's, it's, there's one azygous vein just, and it is on the right. So mainly the uh, posterior intercostal spaces drain ultimately into a zygous vein that ultimately drains into superior vena cava. But if let us dig a little bit 
deep in details and the posterior intercostal veins we divide it into right and left for the right let us start with the right so the first intercostal vein the first intercostal vein let me use this it drained into right brachiocephalic vein right this is number one the second and listen the second third and fourth intercostal veins of course on the right because this is the right right so they form something called right superior intercostal vein not superior not intercostal superior intercostal vein right and also we have left superior intercostal vein forget the left now to the superior intercostal vein then it drains into a zygos right here is the azygos this is the azygos this is the azygos this is the azygos vein okay now we finished the third on the right the first and the third fourth and sometime the uh, we fi we finished the first and we said that the second third and fourth they they create a kind of right superior intercostal vein and ultimately drains into a zygos now the rest now from 5 up to 11 these veins as you see they drain into this vein the azygos vein itself right this is the right now what about the lift again the lift similarly the first one the first intercostal vein drains into left brachiocephalic vein while also the second third and fourth they create a kind of left superior intercostal vein similar to the right but this one because you know we don't have a zygos on the left we have a zygos on the right we said that on the right it drains into a zygos but the left superior intercostal vein drains again into left brachiocephalic vein because we don't have a zygos on the left okay what about the rest um uh, the fifth sixth and uh, uh fifth sixth seventh and sorry where is that this is uh fifth sixth seventh and eighth intercostal vein they create something called or they form accessory hemiazygous vein this one you see this one it's like a comb right we call it accessory hemiazygous not azygous not hemiazygous it's accessory it's above right accessory hemiazygous formed by what by the fifth sixth seventh and eighth intercostal vein then it crosses to the right to drain into mainly into a zygos vein while the ninth uh um tenth eleventh and um twelfth uh, and subcostal vein they create a kind of a vein here called hemi a zygous vein and the hemiazygous vein it drains again crosses to the right and drains into mainly a zygous vein that means on the left forget the first and the second third and fourth now the rest like it drain into accessory hemiazygous and, or they form him accessory hemiazygous and hemiazygous itself and sometimes they join each other then they drain into as some most of the time each one like drains separately into crosses the midline and drains into a zygos on the right that was about the back i know it's a little bit complicated so that's why you can say okay the drainage of posterior intercostal vein ultimately into a zygos vein right okay but the anterior intercostal vein which is you know close and very similar to the arteries the upper six spaces as you see here you know there is intercostal artery and vein so look at these veins also they uh, said that the anterior intercostal vein they have two branches, as you see here one passes at the 
lower border of the rib up and the upper border of the lip below. Anyway, the upper six intercostal spaces they drain into internal thoracic vein. Internal thoracic vein that you know drains into brachiocephalic vein. Brachiocephalic vein. Now, what about the lower five? The lower five intercostal vein similar to the artery they drain into musculophrenic vein right musculophrenic vein and the musculophrenic vein you know united with um, uh, superior epigastric vein to form the internal thoracic vein internal thoracic vein drain into um, brachiocephalic vein here is like if you need to dig deep or read more about that although it's too early for now but Anyway, this is the azygos on the right. It started from the level of L2, and you know uh, the uh, um, if you on the right, if you forget the first second, look the first one. It drains the first vein on the right, drains into brachiocephalic. While the second, third, and sometime fourth, they form superior right superior intercostal vein. Then it drains into azygos. While the rest intercostal veins they drain into azygos vein itself. That connects. Here is the heart, the location of the heart here, right? In which the azygos connects the inferior, ven inferior vena cava to the superior vena cava, right? So it passes, it started at the L2 and ascends on the right, uh, on the right of thoracic um, duct and to the right of the um, esophagus, right? So it, you know, penetrates the diaphragm uh, through the uh, aortic opening with the aorta, I mean, uh, a level of uh, T12, say, and in the posterior mediastinum, passes behind the right border of esophagus and behind the root of the right lung, then at the level of vertebra T4, it arches and uh, above the root of the right lung and enters the middle of the pack of superior vena cava and drains there lymphatics you know uh, this will be covered in lymphatic system but you know there is a general idea about lymphatics that lymph vessels of the intercostal space will follow the uh, general rule which is the deep lymphatics follow arches most of the time deep lymphatics follow arches that means the drainage of the lymph will be uh, similar to the artery so anteriorly you know this is the sternum so there are like parasternal lymph nodes right because you know there is internal thoracic artery here and there so the blood supply here and also the lymphatics to the parasternal lymph nodes um, posteriorly in the back so there is also intercostal nodes and which uh, similar also to the posterior intercostal artery. However, the posterior intercostal nodes drain the uh, lymph from there, plus with the diaphragmatic nodes inferiorly. We talked, uh, my friends, about the first part and second part of uh, thoracic wall. And, you know, we, in the first part, we described the uh, pulling framework already called thoracic cage and then in the second part the lecture today we talked about the intercostal muscles vessels and so forth and we cannot ignore the uh, sternum uh, which is uh, 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 the anterior border of the thoracic cage this sternum or what we call the breastbone the sternum can be like uh, split and uh, in order to get and access to the chest, to the heart, I mean, great vessels and uh, thymus uh, gland, as you see up, right? This is number one. Well, also, uh, regarding the ribs and the fracture of rib, you know, the fracture of rib is really painful condition, as the preosseum of the rib supplied uh, by intercostal nerve um, above and uh, below, uh, sometime in case of uh, really the fracture of the rib is really dangerous because the rib now once fractured it becomes like a knife, so it can 
um, hurt the lung or can penetrate the lung and produce something called pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is like an abnormal collection of air and gas in the plural um, uh, space around that, you know, the plural space, which is the space between the thoracic wall and the um, lung, right? And this, of course, will lead to uh, or would interfere with the normal breathing. Right, so sometimes uh, it's not just one rib fracture. Sometimes, if you have multiple ribs like fractured at the same time uh, during like uh, vehicle accidents, also this can lead for something called when you have multiple ribs fractured, something called a flail chest, flail chest or floating chest. The flail chest that means um, the uh, many ribs like uh, fractured and the chest or the the thoracic wall uh, of that affected area moved in and out as you see during the inspiration and expiration another a clinical correlation related to the thoracic wall something a procedure called thoracentesis thoracentesis is an insertion of the needle like through the intercostal space look at this rib rib number nine and rib number 10 so this is the intercostal space that occupied by intercostal muscle and neurovascular bundle in the costal group and the collateral vessels on the uh, upper border of the rib below uh, so a needle inserted to the uh, a plural cavity you know we would we will talk more about the plural cavity or you can watch the lecture of the uh, lung you can um, get more details about that but anyway uh, as we mentioned in this lecture the, th the plural cavity is this cavity between the lung that covered by visceral pleura and the thoracic wall that composed uh, from external intercostal inner, uh, internal intercostal innermost and in thoracic fascia and the parietal Mm, uh, pleura so the space between parietal pleura at the end and the visceral pleura that covers the lung this space permits the uh, lung to move during uh, inspiration and expiration anyway this space has a little bit of uh, pleural fluid sometimes because of inflammation because of like injury there's like air and fluid or blood pus accumulated there so you need to mm, remove the um, air and excess fluid plus uh, blood pus and so forth out so you get an access there so for something called thoracentesis right so you insert the needle in the intercostal space as you see here so take care to insert the needle in like in between in the intercostal space in the middle say here to be away from the neurovascular bundle here in the costal groove and away from the collateral vessels at the upper border of the rib below. So take like the middle one, the middle space, away from those and those um, below. So uh, in this case, um, uh, in order to get, you know, if you have like pus or blood, usually you will know that uh, more about that in the lecture of the lung. But anyway, the blood will be drained in this space here below, blood and pus. So you need to get the fluid or pus outside. So this recess, this cavity or recess, um, it's called uh, for what we call it, costodiaphragmatic recess costo diaphragmatic this is the diaphragm right and this is the costal area so this recess called costo diaphragmatic uh, recess costo diaphragmatic recess which is like in order to get there which is at the lower border of the lung to get there and avoid the injury of the lower border of the lung go to rib number nine and ten here is the ninth intercostal space at mid axillary line right and insert the needle there in the intercostal uh, space so in this way you get the needle there between the, the rib number nine and ten so make sure that the needle inserted obliquely not directly like that because if you insert it like that that means there is a probability or high chance for the needle to penetrate 
not just the superficial part of the rhesus but also the deep part of the rhesus and go there to the abdomen so let me erase it and here my friends the costodiaphragmatic rhesus the, the site of accumulation of blood and abscess go with the needle like make it um, needle like should be angled upward angled upward to avoid penetrating the deep side of the uh, rhesus okay so one else you want to ask the patient to do like expiration do what expiration zephyr so when you do expiration the lung that means you get the air from lung outside that means the lung will go up that means you have extra space to get in the needle and avoid the injury of the lower uh, pool or part of the uh, or inferior border of the lung you will avoid injury the inferior border of the lung okay insert not just a small needle there in the costodiaphragmatic rhesus you can insert um, uh, something bigger than the needle which is the chest what you call it, chest tube so the chest tube using you know to remove like major amount of uh, say plural uh, uh, fluid pus blood and uh, air so it it's usually done through the and a small incision at the mid axillary mid axillary line at the fourth fifth or sixth intercostal space usually at the level of the nibble you see here so you make a small incision through the skin and you that means you penetrate the skin superficial fascia serratus anterior because you are in the mid axillary line there is a muscle here costal anterior then the external intercostal then you get to the internal intercostal then the innermost and the innermost lined by endothoracic fascia and parietal pleura so there is a space here deep to parietal pleura this is the end of something called thoracic wall so this is the parietal pleura and this is the lung that covered by visceral pleura so this space visceral uh, visceral cavity the pleural cavity here in this pleural cavity you have a chance for blood pus air to accumulate there so you get in the through the chest tube to remove the stuff outside and as i mentioned you can go uh, for example here you can go with the tube up or you can go down so if you want to remove like uh, in case of pneumothorax for example if you want to get the air get inside for a reason or another so you go up through the tube to reach the air accumulated there or you can go with the tube uh, to the costal diaphragmatic recess to remove the um, blood and the fluid or excess fluid or pus accumulated um, uh, there make sure to uh, please uh, leave a space uh, above and below the tube in the intercostal space to avoid injury to a uh, neurovascular bundle here in the rib above and to the collateral vessels and nerve that's located here in the uh, above the upper border of the rib below not shown here anyway you get mainly in the middle right so um, this is about the insertion of uh, just a tube thank you uh, for uh, listening and I hope you find value in it. Thank you. And this is our, our references.